بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Alhamdulillah, first of all, we praise Allah Azza wa Jal for allowing us to see the blessed month of Ramadan. And this is a great joyous occasion for many of us. This is the first Ramadan without restrictions post-pandemic. So I say return to the house of Allah after a long period of almost two years. May Allah give us tawfiq and may Allah make our remaining years easier. This joy is tempered by tremendous feeling of sorrow and sadness. One could never have imagined that there would come a time where we will have a Ramadan here without our Mawlana Muhtaram, Sheikh Mawlana Say, uh, Yusuf Islahi Saab, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. He was a pillar of this community. He was a pillar of many communities. And he was a symbol of Ramadan for us here. And with his passing, we lost a great moral support. We lost a great supporter, a great mercy in the community, a great source of knowledge. With his passing, knowledge has descended a degree and one of the generations has passed. He was one of the last few people of his generation. So it's really, really tough sitting in his position here. This is a tradition that he started I think in the late 80s. So that's almost 30 plus years. From the beginning of the foundation of this masjid, um, he began this tradition of giving tafsir after the taraweeh prayer. And after the witr prayer, it was a very tough time. It's a time that's very challenging. You don't find any center that does uh, or takes advantage of this time period. Everyone wants to leave. But Maulana rahimahullah ta'ala started this tradition and it lasted 30 plus years until right before the pandemic. So when Tanweer asked me to fill in and to continue this tradition, initially I was very, it was a very heavy burden. And Maulna is someone who could not, cannot be replaced. To stand in his shoes is something no one can imagine, especially someone like myself. But then after some days, he gave us some thought and Allah opened our hearts to this idea that if we continue this tradition, you know, Maulna has passed on, but if we continue the tradition that he started over 30 years, which stopped last year, now if we continue this, any good that comes out of this, anyone who would be inspired, anyone who learns anything, all that will be added to his skills on the day of judgment. May Allah raise his ranks, may Allah forgive him, May Allah continue to add to his scales as long as there's good coming out of this community. Allahumma ameen. One of the great lessons that our late Sheikh Islahi used to remind us of, and the reason he did this program, is a great lesson. It's very simple, but it's so profound and so important. And it's lost on many Muslims. And that is this, that the Quran is a book of guidance and instruction. That was his perpetual message. The Quran is a book of guidance and instruction, not a book of ideas, not a book of theories, not a book of entertainment to enjoy his recitation, not a book of, you know, some interesting facts, but it's a practical instruction, a practical guide, it's hidayah. So in the beginning of the Quran, today we recited surah, uh, the, the first juz of the Quran, the very first surah, Surah Al-Fatiha. Fatiha, in essence, is a dua. And if you could summarize Fatiha in one word, it's where's the dua in Surah Al-Fatiha? Which verse? One word, if you could just summarize one ver word. Ihdina. That's the whole point of the surah, which means, oh Allah, guide us. There's a whole beginning of the surah praising Allah, building up to that dua. And then the dua itself, ihdina sirat al-mustaqim, guide us to the straight path. And then the rest of the verses are describing that guidance. But the whole prayer is asking Allah for hidayah, for guidance. And then Allah answers by the next surah. What does Allah say? Alif la mim, al kitab. 
So we just asked for guidance. The beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah says, this is the book. This is the book. It's not a complete sentence. If you understand that you made a dua prior to that, this is the answer to that dua. And that's why Allah says, La Raib. There is no doubt about the fact that this is the book of guidance. You ask for guidance, here it is. La Raib, Allah says, there is no doubt about that. Fihi hudan lil muttaqin. In it is guidance. And then Allah describes who the guidance is for. So actually, the whole book, the message of the book, the message of the Quran is to guide us, guide us to Allah Azza wa Jal. And this is very, very important. Many of us don't realize sometimes we treat the Quran not as guidance, but as something else. Um, Imam al Ghazali, rahimahullah, and I'll take the rest of the moments I have just to share with you some profound lessons. In his Ihya Ulumuddin, a remarkable book, he was a great scholar of great insight. He has a section, a book on the recitation of Quran. Everyone should study that chapter. It is so profound, it has so many lessons. And he shares in it a number of ideas, and his main idea is this, that the Quran is guidance. And he shares with us some unlikely obstacles to that guidance, and that's what I want to share with you today. There are 10 obstacles or detractors of guidance. To get the guidance of the Quran, it's not for everyone. Allah already shared in the Quran in the beginning the, the characteristics of the people of guidance. We should go through those, study those, so we can be among those. Imam al-Ghazali summarized, what are some of the things that take you away from guidance, that prevent you from getting the guidance of the Quran. So first he says that the Quran, what does guidance look like in a practical way? How do you attain the guidance of the Quran? It starts with what Quran is. Quran means a recital. It starts with recitation. But that's just the beginning. There's a number of steps. But most of us, we just stop at the recitation. And we don't go beyond that. So Imam al-Ghazali, he says, وَالْمَقْسُودُ مِنَ الْقِرَاءَةِ التَّدَبُّرِ He says the only purpose of reciting the Qur'an is one thing, tadabbur. Tadabbur, to think about the Qur'an, to reflect over the Qur'an. Tadabbur is not even to understand the Qur'an. That's a given. There's no concept among the early Muslims of reciting Qur'an without understanding. They could not have even imagined such a thing even though that became the norm today in the Muslim society. Mawlana used to remind us of that. This is the only book people read without understanding, and that's a tragedy. But the real purpose is even a step beyond understanding is tadabbur. So how do you, what's the practical shape of the guidance, of atta attaining guidance? Qira'a, then tadabbur, then amal. Three things. Qira'a, reciting with your tongue. Then tadabbur, reflecting and thinking about the message with your mind and understanding it. And then amal, which is where the message enters your heart and it motivates you to action. So this three-step process is, is basically what guidance is. If you want the structure of guidance, it's qira'a, tadabbur, amal. It's your tongue, your mind, and your heart. It starts with your tongue, enters your mind, and it proceeds with the heart. And this was the recitation of the early Muslims. They saw it like that. They didn't see it as any other way. So Imam al-Ghazali shares many uh, points from how the companions used to recite the Quran. He makes a point that many of the companions, they would just memorize one surah, learn it, implement it, and then live by it. And they wouldn't move on until they were ready to move on. Some of them spent years just memorizing one surah. Today we have fast track programs because we're not, we're bypassing this process. We don't have this three prong process, qira'at, adabbur, amal. That was the process of the companions. Abu Abdurrahman al sulami he was the greatest Quranic student of the companions. His teacher was Uthman ibn Affan. His teacher was Ali ibn Abi Talib, Ubay ibn Kaab, Zaid bin Thabit. The best scholars of Quran among the companions he was their student. And he describes how they used to learn Quran. He says, Haddathana ashyakhuna alladheena kanu yuqri'oona nal Quran annahum la yatajawazuna ashra ayatin hatta ya'lamu ma'aniha wa ya'maluna bima fiha 
He says, my teachers, and who are his teachers, I just mentioned their names. My teachers and all of our the students that studied with them, our style was this. We would not go beyond 10 verses until we understood those verses and we lived by those verses. So we took knowledge and practice simultaneously. We did not memorize first and later on we think about it and we learn Arabic and then we think about the meanings and we implement that at a later time. It was simultaneous. So this is very, very important. The Quran, the way the Quran present, presents this, حَقُّ التِّلَاوَةِ لَذِينَ يَتْلُونَهُ حَقَّ تِلَاوَتِهِ أُولَٰئِكَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِهِ Those who recite the Quran as it ought to be recited. What is حَقُّ التِّلَاوَةِ? Imam al-Ghazali describes the same. This is what حَقُّ التِّلَاوَةِ is. Qira'a, tadabbur, and amal. Using your tongue, using your mind, and using your heart. So with that, what are the obstacles or the detractors of guidance, the things that prevent you from getting the guidance of the Quran. So there are 10 and we'll go through them really quickly. Number one is not reading, reciting the Quran, not starting by opening the book. There are so many Muslims that never open the Quran around the world. Allah does not give them the tawfiq to open the Quran, to read it, to study it. And there are many of us that open it, but then we have other obstacles. So the first obstacle is not reading it. The second obstacle is not understanding it. So many of us we recite it, but we don't understand the words. Again, as I mentioned, that this is something Imam al-Ghazali says, فَالْمُجَرَّدْ حَرَكَةُ lisan قَلِيلُ الْجَدْوَى He says, just moving your tongue with the words without understanding has very little benefit. That's not me speaking, this is Imam al-Ghazali. He says people who recite the Quran without understanding, very little benefit to that. We created a whole culture of, you know, celebrating the recitation of Quran, even without the meaning. We have our kids memorize Quran. I'm, I'm not, we're just pushing ourselves to raise our standard. That's what Imam al-Ghazali said. I'm not saying we shouldn't do what we do. But Imam al-Ghazali is reminding us that this is not the purpose of Quran, to memorize it and not understand it. There was this process. So the second uh, obstacle to not obtaining the guidance of the Qur'an is very obvious, not understanding it. Number three, Imam al-Ghazali shares, is reciting too fast. And he says this is a great obstacle to guidance. He says that the one who recites too fast, he can't understand it. And he can't even get to the step of tadabbu. And he says, he says something profound, he said, Al-maqsudu bil qira'a at-tadabbur. Wa li thalika sunnat tartila fil qira'a. So because the purpose of recitation is tadabbur, that's why Allah made tartil. Allah says in the Quran, وَرَتِّلِ الْقُرْآنَ tartila. Allah made this a requirement of recitation. What does tartil mean? It really means to recite every letter separately. To recite deliberately and slowly. So this is, it's a speed. Reciting slowly. And he said, لِأَنَّ tartil Because tartil is what allows you to think about the Quran. And that's the reason why it's legislated to recite the Quran with tartil. لِأَنَّ التَّرْتِيلَ فِي الظَّاهِرِ يَتَمَكَّنَ مِنَ التَّدَبُّرِ فِي الْبَاطِنِ He says, tartil externally is to recite slowly with proper rules, right? In order for your heart to reflect over the internal meanings of the Quran. It has to go side by side. There's no such thing as tartil without meaning. So Imam al-Ghazali shares this. Number... Four, and this is very interesting, he says prioritizing memorization of the Qur'an over understanding. It's very, very interesting to think about. Imam al-Ghazali shares something. He says there are 120,000 companions and only six had memorized the Qur'an. And he says two of them are disputed. Now the numbers based upon research might be up and down, but generally speaking, out of the large body of companions, most of them were not hufal because they had a different methodology in mind. So Imam al-Ghazali shares this as an obstacle to guidance because if you're um, prioritizing memorization at such high speeds, you're bypassing the, that, the tradition of the companions, taking 10 verses at a time, this real holistic way of learning Quran. Hassan al-Basri says, كَانُوا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ بِاللَّيْلِ وَيُنْفِذُونَهَا بِالنَّهَارِ 
the whole night they should they would just repeat verses reflecting over the verses and during the day they would implement them in their lives so it was a very different system a very 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 different approach to the quran number 5 is even more interesting i found this very insightful and from from my particular background he says one of the obstacles to guidance is tajweed and that that might be something very uh, hard to understand and to share my background i my primary uh, field of expertise is tajweed i wrote a tajweed textbook i run an institute i've taught tajweed over uh, you know many years to hundreds of students and he says that when when you're focusing on the pronunciation of the words then shaitan comes to you while you're reciting did i make the ayn properly did i have the attributes properly you're so focused on the letters that you forget about the meaning and that is so true sometimes when you're teaching tajweed you're always listening oh this guy didn't do the mud this guy didn't do the hunna so as teachers it's very hard for us to to bypass that and i find that one of the big hurdles in my own life to recite to listen to quran or is to not try to get away from focusing on the sounds of the letters so this is a this is number 5 number 6 he says uh, blind following or sectarianism blind following of madhahib he says if you already have preconceived ideas and you're reading the quran you're looking for corroboration of your ideas if you already have in your mind how you know certain answers to certain questions when you read the quran you're not going to be listening to allah's voice but you're going to read the voice of your own background or your own school of thought into the Quran. And there are so many tafsir that are written by various scholars. Some of the tafsir look like fit books. Some of them are aqidah manuals. Some of them, they're just approaching a certain um, idea that the author has in mind. And every verse is um, molded or twisted to fit that meaning. This is a great obstacle to attaining the guidance of the Quran when you're when you have ta'assub. He talks about ta'assub, which is uh, you can say sectarianism or extreme affiliation with some group or idea. Number six, or number seven rather. And these are so so you have to understand, you might be very surprised by some of these, you know, great thinkers like Imam al Ghazali, they think outside the box. They challenge us. And, you know, that's why they share these things that might not sound intuitive. Number seven is tafsir. Tafsir is often a detractor from guidance. Tafsir, reading works of tafsir, sometimes can take you away from guidance. And that is so true. You might say, how so? Because many tafsirs, they share incidents. They share stories. They share backgrounds. There is a whole tradition of tafsir bil athar. But let me share with you a quote from Imam al Ghazali. He says, Rabi'uha an yakuna qad qara'a tafsiran zahiran wa a'taqada anna la ma'ana li kalimati al Quran illa ma tanawalahu al naql an ibn Abbas wa Mujahid. Rugayruhuma wa anna ma wara dhalika tafsiru bil ra'i wa anna man fassar al Quran bil ra'i fa qad tabawa maqadahu min al nar. He said there's a great misconception that tafsir or understanding Quran is only by finding out what Ibn Abbas or Mujahid or this authority said on every verse. And anything other than that is using your opinion and using your opinion in the Quran leads to hellfire. So this is a misunderstanding of an idea. And he says, he makes a point that if this was, a, if this was true, that tafsir is all written down and transmitted, but in these reports, then why is there a command for tadabbur? What are you thinking about? What are you reflecting over in the Quran, in the night? And he said, why were all these scholars spent their nights reflecting over Quran and writing their own tafsir? So this work is ongoing. This is very, very important. There's a great example of how tafsir can misguide people. Um, and again, I'm not saying all tafsir. We're trying to raise our bar. Um, we have to understand what, what, what scholars like this mean. There's an interesting quote that I read in, there's a book called Thomas Jefferson's Quran. I don't know if anyone read it, but it's about the founding fathers of this country, Thomas Jefferson uh, and 
he had a minister, his imam was uh, John Leland. So their relationship with Quran, with, with, with Islam rather, was very interesting. They had some sort of respect, and that's why they enshrined the Bill of Rights to protect different religious groups, and they mentioned Muslims on various occasions. But they didn't understand Islam very well. So John Leland once said, he wrote an article, and when I read this quote, I was very shocked. And I kept thinking about where he got this idea from. So John Leland says this, that it will remind a man of an article in Al-Quran. That's how they used to write about Al-Quran back then, hundreds of years ago. It reminds a man of an article in Al-Quran that the world stands upon a great ox. An ox, animal, cow. That the world stands upon a great ox. The ox stands upon a great stone. The stone rests upon the shoulders of an angel. And the angel stands upon God knows what. So these great thinkers, you know, they were intelligent people. They were great thinkers. But they had these ideas about Islam. So John Leland, who was the, the archetype behind the Bill of Rights, he believed the Quran contained a basic belief that this whole world rests upon an ox. The ox is standing upon a stone. And the stone is on an angel. And the angel is on God knows what. So when I read that, it was so nonsensical. I was like, where would they get this information from? Lies or this or that. And I kept digging into it over the years. And eventually I found the answer. If you open up the Tafsir ibn Kathir. And go to Surah Al-Qalam. Noon. Wal-Qalami wa ma yasturun. Ma anta bi ni'mati rabbika bi majnoon. Wa innaka la ala khulqin azim. Beautiful Surah. Noon by the pen and what, what it writes by, you, O Messenger of Allah, are not possessed. You are not insane. And you will get a great reward. And you are an exalted character. Beautiful surah. Beautiful surah about the Nabuwa of Muhammad wasallam. You open Tafsir ibn Kathir, the beginning of the surah, the first thing he says, Noon wa huwa al azim tahta aradin al sabah Noon is the name of a big whale upon which the world rests. And then he has almost two pages of various hadith reports with Isnad, sharing various types of hadith. That the first thing Allah created was the pen. Then Allah created water vapor. Then Allah created the whale, a big giant whale. Then Allah created the earth. And there are different versions of the story. One of them is, in al arda ala sakhratin. That the world rests upon a stone. The stone is on the horns of an ox. And the ox is on something else. And if you look in Tafsir al-Tabari, in this surah, the very first thing he shares is the same thing. So these tafasir, when you open up, if you want to learn Surah Al-Qalam, you open up Tafsir ibn Kathir, you will find a couple of pages of discussion of the world being on an ox or something like this, and various stories like that. With Isnad, all coming from various books, books of hadith. Thankfully, none of them are from Bukhari or Muslim. None of them are sound hadith. None of them, they're all, you could call fake hadith. They're not real hadith, but they're part of our tradition. They're in our books. And unfortunately, many books of tafsir are filled with this. So now you can imagine how someone in the 16th, 17th century could have come up with an idea like that. Because it's in our books. And this is a time where people didn't know Arabic. There was very little translation. So it's hard to distinguish tafsir from Quran. So you tell me, someone who reads the tafsir of Surah Al-Qalam, and just the tafsir and focuses on that, is it going to bring you the message of the surah or is it going to potentially, and I say potentially, you can still, tafsir is very valuable. You still learn a lot. We have to know how to approach it. But potentially it can take you away from the message of the Quran. And one can only imagine, had these people, intelligent people like this, not had a misnotion like this, maybe they would be closer to guidance. I'm not saying that's the only reason that they weren't guided, but you know there are things that take you closer to guidance and things that take you farther away. So tafsir can often be a distraction, a detractor of guidance. Um, number eight is sin. 
And this is very, very important. Imam Ghazali shares a beautiful parable. He says the Quran is when you hold the Quran and you recite it, your heart is a mirror and the Quran is shining in the mirror. And if you're sinning, if you're involved in takabur or arrogance, you have rust and the mirror becomes shaded, it becomes dusty, so you can't see the message of the Quran. So it's very, very profound. And he, this is a great uh, parable. If you're sinning, your heart is going to be averse to the message of the Quran because there's going to be um, clouds and rust and you're going to have to chip it away. That's why Allah says in the Quran, Tabusiratan wa dhikra li kulli abdin munib in Surah Qaf. Allah says this message of revelation is tabusira and dhikra. Tabusira and dhikra means guidance that settles in your heart, a reminder that you take that you take to heart. You know, when you read information, it's just information. When it really affects you, it's dhikra. And the Quran is dhikra, it's something that's meant to be internalized. So who is it for? Likulli abdin munib, every servant that turns to Allah. So one of the conditions of guidance, you have to turn to Allah. You have to make istighfar. You have to keep returning and, and connecting to Allah and, and confessing your sins because those sins are going to get between you and guidance. Uh, number nine, considering the Quran remote, away from you. That when you read the Quran, there is this tension that when you read the Quran, oh, this is about Quraysh. This is about Abu Lahab. You read Tabbat, Abu La Tabbat Yada Abi Lahab bin Watab. You read a surah like that. You say, well, this is about Abu Lahab, nothing to do with me. So you put it in your mind kind of away from you. And he said, this is Tabarid. So you read about the mushrikeen of Quraysh. Oh, that's the mushrikeen of Quraysh. So this is a trap of shaitan that makes you think that everything in the Quran is directed to someone else. So Imam Ghazali, one of the internal states, he recognizes or he recommends that all of us need to, to, to go through when we're reciting. He says, he calls it takhsis. He says, وَهُوَ أَنْ يُقَدِّرْ أَنَّهُ الْمَقْصُودِ بِكُلِّ خِطَابٍ فِي الْقُرْآنِ This is to consider, when you recite the Qur'an, you should consider that every single address in the Qur'an is speaking to you, personally. You need to have that personal connection. And that's very, very important. He says the stories are not just for storytelling. The Qur'an is not a storybook. It's not a history book. Everything is meant for a purpose. He says, فَمَا مِنْ قِصَّةٍ فِي الْقُرْآنِ إِلَّا لَهَا فائدة. There is not a single story or mention in the Qur'an except that it has some benefit for you and me. So this is very, very important considering that the Qur'an applies to me and you. And finally, the last thing we'll share is action, amal. The Qur'an is a practical guide. Again, it starts with the tongue and you have to reflect on You have to understand the meaning. Then you have to reflect on the meaning until it settles in your heart. And when it settles in your heart, it manifests in your actions. So that is very, very important. Amal is very, very important. That's the, the way of the companions that you have to act upon the Quran. I had an interesting conversation with somebody on this topic, or not on this topic, but it made me think about this. I was speaking to a Muslim helping him, and he was um, someone who has who was addicted to alcohol. So he drinks wine every night, and his wife was speaking to me, how can we help him? And I gave him advice, you know, this is Ramadan, is coming up, it's just two days away. Why don't you help him read the Quran? And maybe reading the Quran, you know, he'll be inspired. And she said, oh, mashallah, he reads the Quran every single day in Ramadan and he fasts. I said, okay, then maybe he needs to read it with the meaning. He said, no, he reads the Tatarjuma, the meaning every single day. He fasts every single day, he reads the Quran, and he reads it with meaning, but then every night he drinks. So this is, so there are many people like that in the world that, you know, the guidance is there, but just something stops them from taking the final step. That's very, very important. Quran is for Al-Quran yuradu bihi al-amal. The Salaf used to say the Quran, its only purpose is amal. And you have to act upon it. That's very, very important. Like Hassan al-Basri. Hassan al-Basri, and I'll say this as the last thing, he says that he was complaining about people who mechanically recite Quran. He said, all of you, you divide up the night into hours and you put like one juz here or one juz there. That's how you finish the Quran every week. But he said the Salaf, what they used to do, كَانُوا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ بِاللَّيْلِ وَيُنْفِذُونَهَا بِالنَّهَارِ 
And he said they only took a small portion, but they were doing the nice, they would repeat those portions, reflect over them, think about them, and during the day they would implement them in their lives. So this is very, very important. These are great profound lessons from Imam al-Ghazali, uh, 10 great detractors of the guidance of the Quran. So let us make this month special. Uh, we go through the right process. May Allah give us tawfiq to understand the Quran, to live by it, to reflect by it. May Allah give all of us tawfiq to finish this month very, very strong. Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqa wa rizukna tiba'a wa arina al-baatila baatila wa rizukna ishtinaba. Allahumma tawafana muslimin wa alhitna bi salihin ghayr khazaya wa la maftunin. Wa sallallahu ala khayr khalqihi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. I have some planners I share every year for Ramadan just to help you organize the day, keep track of how many prayers you um, prayed in the masjid and your Quran. And so feel free to take some. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa